It is therefore time for question period. The member from Nipissing. <clears throat> Thank you very much and good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Finance Minister. Ontario PC leader Patrick Brown was in Scarborough this morning. He was talking to middle class families. He was telling them about the People's Guarantee, the guarantee that a PC government will cut taxes for the middle class by 22.5% and reduce taxes for first income tax bracket by 10 per cent, giving a break to those who need it most. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, a PC government will cut taxes and make life more affordable for middle class families. Why won't this Liberal government? Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, not one single Ontario will receive the tax cuts that this member is advocating for or advertising. Even before the election has even started, they're making promises that they can't keep. I would argue, step down now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Finance. The People's Guarantee offers a reasonable response to years of government mismanagement. Right. Right. Kevin Page, the former parliamentary budget officer, had this to say, quote, the fiscal estimates underlying the Ontario PC platform have been deemed reasonable by nonpartisan Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy, here, here. University of Ottawa. Speaker Kevin Mulligan, professor of economics at the Vancouver School of Economics, says, in my view, quote, a government with firm attention to cost management can achieve savings in the range proposed in the PC platform. Quote. Speaker, which one of these esteemed, respected Canadian economists does the Liberal government disagree with today? Can you say it, please? Minister. Thank goodness, Mr. Speaker, that Kevin Page was there to keep an eye on these folks and use notes at the end of their glossy magazine to tell the truth. Yeah. And the truth is, there's $12 billion in cuts under their plan, Mr. Speaker. The truth is, the effective marginal tax rate that they're proposing is not true. It can't happen, Mr. Speaker. And, the, and Kevin Page insisted upon that in order to provide his name. I would ask the member opposite, what is it that you're going to cut, and how much is the carbon tax that's triple that of cap and trade is going to cost families on their gas bills, Mr. Speaker? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Do you see it, please? Do you see it, please? Start the clock. Final supplementary. Uh, back to the minister. You know, Speaker, I must say the Liberal spin is embarrassing. John Michael McGrath pointed out the facts. The Liberals are lying about a hidden 12. The member. The member will withdraw. Withdraw. If it happens again, I'm going to warn the person who chooses to use that language. Final, no, not final supplementary. You're finished. Finished. Uh, speaker, we will also increase the Ontario sales tax credit by $100 per adult and $100 per child in order to bring real relief to Ontario's low-income residents. That's money back in their pockets, and that's money that will combat the unaffordable policies created by this Liberal government. Right, the people who need it most will get it. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, does the minister not agree that lower and Middle-income families finally deserve a break. 
All right, let's be clear. Kevin Page illustrated for the rest of the public to acknowledge that the 22.5% that you're proposing is false. It's, it's completely untrue and cannot be achieved for the people of Ontario based on what they've said. Yeah. Furthermore, the member opposite has just cited our fiscal plan, and he's building his proposals and his assumptions on our fiscal plan, Mr. Speaker. Furthermore, what they've done just does not add up. They're cutting revenues, they're cutting expenses, but they're increasing carbon tax substantively. They cannot be trusted. They're making guarantees that they cannot fulfill. Step down, Mr. Speaker. You are talking. You are talking to me. Can I break my record now? No. With an honest attempt to try to see if the members themselves could take care of themselves in decorum, one round is finished. You cannot. We are in warnings, and I will use them immediately. So you've had your fun for one round. It's over. Supplement, uh, new question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. The Toronto Star editorial headline read that the People's Guarantee, quote, deserves a serious look from voters. Here, here. That's because it offers real solutions to make life affordable for middle class families. Here, here. It deserves a look, Speaker, because the People's Guarantee offers real, much needed, and much deserved tax cuts, 22 and a half percent for middle class families. Here, here, here. But instead of giving it a serious here. look, instead of knowledge, acknowledging this is the path Ontario needs to bring real relief to families, Liberal members choose to repeat nonsense. Sir? They know it's nonsense, and I hope they quickly realize, Speaker, how foolish they actually sound. Families deserve a lot better from you. Sure Mr. Speaker, why won't the Liberals Question. support tax cuts to middle-class families? Thank you. Minister? Well, let's quote a few other things, Mr. Speaker. Um, using the numbers presented in that glossy magazine, uh, reaffirmed by Kevin Page as incoherent and frankly false, because they're not going to be able to achieve 22 percent tax cuts. Furthermore, Global Mail states this, the problem with the people's guarantee is that it is a bit too clever, fiscally risky, and economically incoherent, Mr. Speaker. They are not delivering a tax cut to the people of Ontario. In fact, they're going to deliver a net tax increase with the carbon tax that they're providing that is twice as much as what we are incurring today, Mr. Speaker. And the tax cut. The member from Simcoe Gray is warned. The question is what are you cutting? What amounts? What hospitals are you cutting? Are you going to cut pharmacare for people under 25? Are you going to cut tuition for those that are getting it free? Are you cutting health care and education? And the Stop the clock. The member from Etobicoke North is warned. You have one wrap up sentence. Their plan is all about cuts and deficits, Mr. Speaker. This, uh, this member has fought for balanced budget. Ladies. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Well, I can tell the minister, back to the minister, what, what we'll be cutting are Liberal MPPs. That's what our <laughs> Steve Pakin, one of the most Steve Pakin, one of the most respected journalists, had this to say about Kevin Page's review. Quote, one little sentence sets the progressive conservative platform apart. Quote, it's a thumbs up from one of the most respected economic analysts in the country. And under the PC plan, middle and lower income families benefit the most. Only our party will put money back in here, their here. pockets. Here, here. That's the money to combat the unaffordable policies created by this government. Money for people who need the help most. Mr. Speaker, why is this government attacking our numbers? Is it because they don't want to bring tax cuts to middle class families? 
Minister. Mr. Speaker, there's the same party that is not supporting Ontario families, the same party that is rolling back minimum wage, the same party that didn't support our plan to provide for more hospitals and nurses and education. It's the same family that voted against university free tuition, the same family that voted against free tuition and free prescriptions for those under 25. It's the same family that the theme party that member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. Kevin Page in his notes made it clear that their proposal, their plan doesn't add up. That they can't be trusted because what they're proposing is a tax that will not be achieved by any Ontarian. They're misleading the province. They should The member will withdraw. I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. The member from Elgin Middlesex London is warned. Finish. A finance critic should take every precaution to be Answer. fiscally prudent and build contingency to their plan. They have none in this plan, and their guarantee will illustrate the fact that they should step down. Final supplement. Thank you, Speaker. Well, obviously the minister is reading a different book, Speaker, because Kevin Page calls our plan reasonable. That's something he could never call their plan, Speaker. Our People's Guarantee offers a 22 and a half percent tax cut to middle-class families. Our plan offers an increase to the Ontario sales tax credit of $100. Meanwhile, the Liberal, the Liberal government demands higher taxes and higher fees. That's the way it always is, Speaker. They can't afford to pay their Liberal insiders any other way. But we think it's time to put the people first, here, here. not the insiders. Mr. Speaker, I ask one more time. Why won't this government support tax cuts for middle class families? Thank you. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we have taken steps to support middle class families. That party voted against every one of those very measures, Mr. Speaker, and instead, they're pretending. I can do this all day because I feel fit. The member from Niagara West, Glanbrook, is warned. Carry on. They're pretending to provide tax cuts when, in fact, they're not. In fact, their plan is both a social and fiscal deficit to the province of Ontario. There's no prudence. They're going into deficits. They're putting in assumptions for $12 billion that they're not able to achieve. It's reckless, irresponsible. It puts us in our way. We'll do this all day long. The, member, the Minister of Agriculture, Tourism, Agriculture and Rural Affairs is warned. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. Members of the Ontario Health Coalition are joining us today in the galleries, and I want to thank them for being here. Year after year, we've seen this Liberal government and the Conservatives before them cutting public hospitals and pushing health care services into private them. clinics. And now this Liberal government wants to open the doors even wider and roll out the red carpet for even more for-profit private clinics. Buried deep inside Bill 160, the Premier's Harper-style health omnibus bill, is Schedule 9, a plan to clear the way for new private clinics and make it harder for ordinary families to get the health care that they need. Why is this government, like the Conservatives before them, intent on privatizing even more of our health care system? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, nothing could be further from the truth, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I welcome uh, the members of the Ontario Health Coalition that are here today. We've been, over the past number of days, working closely with the Ontario Health Coalition and other stakeholders uh, for a common agenda and a common goal. One of the things that this uh, act, if passed, will actually uh, provide through Schedule 9 is it will prevent <coughs> any further private hospitals right. in this province. We currently have six private hospitals that were grandfathered into yeah, legislation from 1931 That's in the true. previous government, Mr. Speaker, not our own. And what this legislation does is it actually it, it requires that those six entities transition out into a new regulatory and oversight regime and Answer. no 
further private hospitals will be allowed in this province. Mr. Speaker, it is an important measure, and I want to thank the Ontario Health Coalition for proposing additional language thank for you. amendments that we're going to introduce to make that crystal clear. To Thank you. Supplementary. Truth is, the Ontario Ho uh, Health Coalition says, and I quote, this new act is essentially a new private hospitals and clinics act. And you know what? More privatization is absolutely the last thing we need in our health care system in the province of Ontario. Thanks to the Liberals and the Conservatives, there are over a thousand for-profit private clinics in Ontario today, taking scarce health care dollars out of our public system and handing that money right over to private corporate profits. The Premier's health care privatization bill allows private cl clinics to apply to open their doors at any time they wish. Speaker. And by repealing the Private Hospitals Act, this omnibus bill actually removes the 44-year-old ban on future private hospitals Question. in Ontario. Why is this government opening its arms to more private clinics when private clinics only make it harder for Ontario families to get the health care they Thank need? You. Well, Mr. Speaker, under this government and hopefully all future governments, there will be no more private hospitals in this province. There are six that exist that were grandfathered into legislation many, many decades ago, as the, member, as the leader of the third party uh, rightly points out. We are making it crystal clear that we are not going to allow any further private hospitals. We're, we're, we've got legislation that will require that. We're repealing an act that allows for private hospitals. We're requiring all the existing six to transition into, say, long-term care or others, but with enhanced oversight and accountability and transparency that they currently don't have, Mr. Speaker. And we're working with the Ontario Health Coalition and other stakeholders to add additional language to make it crystal so clear to all Answer. of us that we should not only share the same goal, we're going to attain, attain that goal of no more private Thank hospitals. You. Speaker, the first thing this government did after getting elected last election is turn around and privatize Hydro One without a mandate. And now on their way out of office with no mandate, they're trying to privatize more of our public hospital services. And Speaker, we will not let them get away with it. The National Union of Public and General Employees says this bill will, quote, make it easier for private hospitals and clinics to expand and more are difficult for the minister to stop them. Yeah. It allows anyone to apply to open a private clinic at any time, Speaker. It changes the name of private clinics to community health facilities, which would be laughable if it wasn't so offensive to not-for-profit community health care. And despite what the minister says, the health privatization bill that they've introduced Question. removes the 44-year-old ban on future private hospitals in Ontario. Why is this government doing exactly what we expect from the Conservatives Thank and you. privatizing the health care people rely on. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, once again, the leader of the third Steve party has it completely yeah, wrong. So we are, there are six hot private hospitals in this province. I was surprised to learn that when I became health minister. It was grandfathered in by a government, not our own, many decades ago. So we're taking measures, and the current regime through the Private Hospitals Act, which is almost 100 years old, Mr. Speaker, it doesn't provide for the requisite accountability and transparency that we, and oversight that we would expect of all our health care facilities in this province. So we're adding that oversight and that transparency and the accountability. We're making it crystal clear that this government will not tolerate or allow any additional or future private hospitals. It will be crystal clear. And again, I want to thank the Ontario Health Coalition and other partners because over the past yes, days, sir. perhaps the NDP hasn't been listening, we've been working together to make that crystal clear that that will be the case. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Acting Premier. While the Liberals are acting like Conservatives when it comes to uh, opening the door to private hospitals, the Conservatives announced this weekend that their platform is going to be 
acting like the Liberals when it comes to hydro policy. The Conservatives are going to keep the $40 billion Liberal hydro borrowing scheme that will see people's hydro bills skyrocket right after the election, and this plan is no good for anyone except bankers, Speaker. Clearly, the Conservatives and the Liberals see eye to eye when it comes to forcing Ontario families and businesses to pay for their pre-election political schemes. Why won't this Liberal government, once and for all, Speaker, admit that hydro should be a public good, controlled by the people of Ontario for the benefit of every single family and every single business in this province, and reverse the sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pleased to rise and once again talk about Hydro One and what it's been doing to actually help its customers, Mr. Speaker, and the work that we have done as a government to ensure that we have reduced rates for Hydro One customers between 40 and 50 percent, Mr. Speaker. And that's something that these families in northern and rural communities are seeing day in and day out off of their bills, Mr. Speaker. And that's because of this government acting. The opposition voted against that, Mr. Speaker. They voted against against helping families see a reduction of 40 to 50 percent on their bills. They voted against, Mr. Speaker, helping First Nations individuals living on reserve see their delivery charge removed, Mr. Speaker. They voted against the Ontario Electricity Support Program and the enhancements to help low-income individuals, Mr. Speaker. We've ensured that we've helped families and businesses right across the province, Mr. Speaker. Answer. They have cleaner air to breathe, they have a better system to work at, and now, Mr. Speaker, Thanks to this government, a more affordable system. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the privatized Hydro One has already applied for numerous rate increases. They've invested in foreign coal-burning companies instead of Ontario families, and now they want the ability to force people who are struggling with their bills to install prepay meters. In short, the company is looking out for its own profits, not Ontario families or Ontario businesses. In fact, in Hydro One's proposal to install these uh, prepay meters, they say that people who are at high risk for non-payment are going to be the targets. Clearly, the plan is to make money from families who are struggling and use it to line the pockets of already wealthy shareholders. Can the acting premier explain to Ontarians why the privatized Hydro One's priority is boosting its profits and not helping families and businesses Martin. keep the lights on? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hydro One has come forward with the voluntary winter um, reconnection program, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that they can help families who are struggling. They then work with those families to make sure that they can be reconnected and come up with a payment plan, Mr. Speaker. They're working hard on being a better company for families. When it comes to the prepaid meters, Mr. Speaker, since last week, everyone is well aware that this is an opt-in program. If it is even allowed, Mr. Speaker, by the OEB, the Ontario Energy Board is the entity that is quasi-judicial, will review the program, will review the application, and then make a decision based off of its review. The OEB, in the past, has turned down rate applications, has turned down other types of applications like this, Mr. Speaker, because they have the best interests of ratepayers at heart. That is their mandate, Mr. Speaker. Answer. So we're going to continue to allow the OEB to do what they need to do when it comes to ensuring they protect ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. And on this side of the House, this government Thank will you. continue to act to protect ratepayers. The minister continues to call this plan voluntary or opt-in. Nowhere in the Hydro One proposal to install prepay meters can you find the word voluntary. What you will find is this exact quote, Speaker, and I'm quoting, with a prepaid meter, electricity is paid up front. Once the prepaid amount is used up, power is cut off until the customer is able to load the meter with more credits." End quote. Right there, in black and white, the privatized Hydro One says it plans to use prepay meters to get around the rule in Ontario banning wintertime hydro disconnections. Instead of working with people who are struggling, Hydro One will let their meters simply run out. Can the acting premier explain again why she thinks the privatized Hydro One Question. is in the best interest of Ontarians? You see it, please. You say it, please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. There's a lot of assumptions being made by the third party when it comes to two paragraphs in a 2,000-page document, Mr. Speaker. When the company has even been on.
Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the company is on the record saying this is not the intention of that two paragraphs, Mr. Speaker. The intention is to give people choice, Mr. Speaker. Something that that party has never done when it comes to the electricity sector. Even their pie in the sky plan, Mr. Speaker, doesn't offer choice. It even excluded looking at helping low income individuals, Mr. Speaker. But not us, Mr. Speaker. We made sure we brought forward the OESP program, which actually helps low income individuals. We brought forward a 25% reduction Answer. for all families right across the province. And the Hydro One, R1, and R2 reduction, Mr. Speaker, according to the Fair Hydro Plan, can see a 40 to 50 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. Thank that you. is action helping people. Thank you. New no question. The member from the and Carlton. My question is to the Acting Premier. Uh, yesterday, my leader, Patrick Brown, joined me in Nepean. He was there to stress our people's guarantee. I introduced him to a 12 year old girl, Anna, and her family. Her family works hard as new Canadians, but because of Liberal policies, they pay more and they are consistently getting less. That's why the People's Guarantee will help them and why they endorsed it. It will help families like Anna's by reducing middle-class income taxes by 22.5 per cent. It will help middle-class families by refunding up to 75 per cent of their childcare expenses, and it will help hockey players like Anna by restoring the fitness tax credit. After 14 years of Liberal taxes, families like Anna des deserve a break. They deserve a break to get ahead. Mr. Speaker, why has the Question. Liberal government for 14 years forgotten families like Anna's? Well, Speaker, um, we've been hearing a lot about this uh, tax cut 25 2.5% tax cut for middle-income Ontarians. Well, Speaker, it's their number one promise. The only problem is, if you think if you're promising people 22.5% cut, you think you're going to get a 22.5% cut. Speaker, member from the P and Carleton is warned. Finish. Speaker, not one single person in the province of Ontario will get a 22.5 percent uh, income tax cut. Not one single person. You're telling the public one thing, and you're Chair. actually doing something entirely different. It's time for your party to take a good Answer. hard look at this. It's, it's, it's simply inaccurate. It is wrong. I'm not going to use the words Thank the speaker you. won't let me use. I stand, you sit. Supplementary. What's inaccurate and full of baloney is that answer that that minister just provided this government. You don't have to take our word for it. You can take Kevin Page's word for it, and it's on the back of that document. You can also take Kevin Milligan, professor of economics at the Vancouver School of Economics. He had this to say about. Stop the clock. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell is warned. The, the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services is warned. Finish. I know that they're nervous because I was at the Great Cup on Saturday with Pat, Sunday with Patrick Brown. People were coming up telling us how much they loved our platform. We were at hockey rinks all across Ottawa. They loved the People's Guarantee. But let's go back to Kevin Milligan. He said the proposal has two main advantages. First, it delivers the largest benefit to lower and middle class. I wouldn't risk it. I guess this platform cuts real deep, Speaker, but let's try to get back to what Kevin Milligan has said. This Stop the clock. Stop the clock. There are uh, two sides to this issue. When the member says things that she knows will inflame, I wouldn't go there. Finish your question, please. Just trying to ask a question. First, it delivers the largest benefit to lower and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not happy with that. that. That almost challenges the chair. Wasn't trying to do that, chair. I'm, not, I'm not asking for any comments. That's, that's it. It's over. Please ask your question. 
First, it delivers the largest benefit to lower- and middle-income families who need help with child care expectancy. Second, it supports flexibility for those families who need part-time care, shift work, or regular care arrangements. It goes on to say the Ontario PC child care proposal offers improved, flexible benefits for all Ontario families. Why won't you endorse you. our plan? <laughs> Thank you. The member from Timmins James Bay is warned. Minister. As speaker, I can assure you, the members opposite, the people of Ontario, we will never endorse a plan that contains $12 billion in cuts. And we will never endorse a plan that pretends to be something that it isn't. Let me repeat, not one single person in this province, not one— Like I said, I can do this all day. The member from Whitby, Oshawa, is warned. Finish. One single person will see a 22.5 per cent decrease in their income taxes. Speaker, what the PCs are talking about and what they're actually proposing to do are two totally different things. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Acting Premier, the Chief of the Grassy Narrows First Nation is in the Legislature today asking that the province contribute to building and operating a health facility for the people of Grassy Narrows and Wabasimoon First Nations. The province has known for decades that mercury was present on the paper mill site and that mercury contamination was not decreasing in the English Wabagoon River system. Last September, ministers in the Liberal government were informed that mercury contamination continued on the site, even though the Premier continued to say that any cleanup would cause more risk to the population. As many as 90 per cent of the people in these communities show signs of mercury contamination and have been abandoned to their fate. Will the Premier today commit to making funds available for establishment and operation of a mercury care health facility in this community now? Question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Minister of Indigenous Relations. Thank you for that question. Speaker, we are deeply concerned about the challenges faced by Grassy Narrows and indeed White Dog Nation in that uh, area. I can tell you that uh, I have had, along with my federal counterparts, various uh, ministers and technical people, two meetings with my federal colleagues involving the chiefs. I can tell you, Speaker, that tomorrow we are having a meeting here in Toronto. I am meeting with my federal counterpart, Minister Philpott, and with the chiefs of Grassy Narrows and with the chief of White Dog. On the agenda tomorrow is this issue of what to do about Grassy Narrows. I have received the request for the treatment uh, facility. This is a matter that will be discussed tomorrow between the province, the federal government, and the First Nations concerned. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Acting Premier, pain is a constant reality for people with mercury poisoning. Lack of muscle control, tunnel vision, and other symptoms make life very difficult. The Japanese long ago provided special health care for mercury-poisoned people in the city of Minamata. Does the acting premier feel no sense of responsibility for dragging out this problem? What does the acting premier have to say to the generations, the young people, the elders, and the leaders of the Grassy Narrows and Wabasamoon people, left with painful and debilitating legacy of mercury poisoning of their river and lands. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Minister. As I said in my uh, uh, first answer, we are deeply concerned about this issue. That is why this meeting has been arranged tomorrow with the provincial government, the federal government, the federal cabinet minister is coming down, Minister Philpod, who is responsible for the operations side of the federal ministry. I know that this subject matter that the member opposite has raised is on the agenda tomorrow. Uh, we will uh, consider uh, what we hear from both the federal government and the First Nations and the province, but we are working towards a solution for this. 
In the meantime, I should say that we have provided $5.2 million for some remediation workup preliminary to tackling the actual problem. We've also set aside $85 million. Uh, that's in a, a fund that is co-managed by the province and Answer. the First Nation to address these issues. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from the from North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sports. Television production across North America. Last year, in fact, was the third straight record-breaking year for film and TV production in Ontario. Our government, of course, understands how strong the competition is across North America to attract film shoots, both foreign and domestic, and to provide an attractive location for local productions. And that's why we're budgeting $481 million this year for tax credits related to this. Speaker, Ontario also has many other advantages as a great place to make films and TV, including innovative technology such as IMAX, as well as a world-class creative talent and infrastructure. Speaker, my question is this. Que la peut sur le Could the minister develop on the work that the government is doing? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the Etobicoke North MP for his question. I go to the House Speaker for their inaugural Queen's Park Day and thank them for the work they do to build up our province's film and television industry. Speaker, on this side of the House, we know that our Ontario screen-based industries showcase our province to the world and our true economic drivers. Investments in film and TV production support over 35,000 jobs and contribute $1.7 billion to our economy. Wow. A great recent example, the production of IT hired over 1,200 cast and crew in communities across Ontario and spent over $28 million in just 60 days of filming at local businesses, hotels, caterers, restaurants, lumber and construction suppliers. And that's just one of the reasons that makes me so proud to work with our film and TV industry to support these productions that are garnering Answer. attention from around the world and bringing jobs and investment right here to Ontario. Right. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Uh, Speaker, it's clear that Canadian and film and TV industry has never been in better shape. It's flourishing. And it's important for the people in Northern Ontario as well to know that this government, under the leadership of Premier Wynne and Minister McMahon, are making investments that help grow the economy and create jobs. Speaker, this government is committed to supporting and growing the film and television industry in Northern Ontario as well. Flagship productions such as the critically acclaimed hit TV series Letter Kenny, shot in Sudbury, have been made possible by grant increases approved by our government. Speaker, can the minister please explain how specific programs that our government champions are working to help television and film industry in the north and what this means for people in Northern Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Speaker, our commitments to investing in uh, stability in terms of our film and TV tax credits is just one of the reasons why Northern Ontario is soaring, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister of Northern Development and Mines for his tremendous leadership in building up our sector in the north. I know that the sector is especially important to the economy in Northern Ontario, which this year invested nearly $23 million in film and TV production in Northern Ontario alone. Since 2014, NOHSC has invested invested $76 million, supporting 136 film and TV projects in Northern Ontario. And of course, as the member mentioned, Letterkenny is just one of the successful shows, Mr. Speaker. We're committed to creating jobs in the North, Speaker, and giving our young people a diversified economy where they can have the choice to remain at home, Mr. Speaker. That's just part of our plan to build Ontario up. Answer. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Your question, the member from Dufferin Calvary. Thank you. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Ontario has a gap in its health care system. Too many people are slipping through the cracks and not receiving the mental health treatment they deserve. There is a mental health crisis in Ontario, and that is why Patrick Brown and the Ontario PC Party committed $1.9 billion over 10 years to support mental health services. This will be the largest mental health commitment in Canadian provincial history. Rob Jameson, president of the Ontario Police Provincial Association reacted to our People's Guarantee saying, quote, great to see such a commitment to mental health. We need to invest more in those in crisis and those requiring support. Will the Liberal government match the PC party commitment to mental health services? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you say that, please? You say that, please? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, absolutely 
amazed at this change of heart because it was only six or seven months ago that the PC party as a whole voted against our investments in mental health, investments that created Canada's first ever program for cognitive behavioral therapy that provides amazing outcomes for individuals with mood disorders like anxiety and depression. Mr. Speaker, they voted against us creating up to 10 new wellness centres for youth across this province. Mr. Speaker, but it, I'm trying to figure out still, with their $12 billion in cuts that are explicitly referenced on page 76 of their People magazine, Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering what cuts they're going to make to health care, yeah. what cuts they're going to make to Sir, education, how many nurses they're going to fire, because we know when they were last in government, they closed 10,000 hospital beds Thank and fired you. thousands of nurses. We will never vote for a Liberal budget. The minister is trying to change history. Ten years ago, Select Committee on Mental Health and Addictions. For far too long, people are sitting on waiting lists without the mental health care they need and when they need it. Our plan is going to make real difference for individuals dealing with mental health illness across Ontario. But don't take it from me. Kimberly Moran, the CEO of Children's Mental Health Ontario, said, and I quote, so pleased to see topping up elementary and secondary school supports for services targeted at improving mental health and well-being, including funding awareness campaigns as part of the People's Guarantee. Will the Liberal government agree to match the PC Party's historic Senior. commitment to mental health in Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, they voted against our investments in behavioral supports and long-term care. They voted against our $100 million dementia strategy for, to provide support yeah. with, for, for families and individuals with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. Mr. Speaker, we saw a five-point plan from the PCs before. We saw it in 1995 from Mike Harris. He didn't even have as draconian cuts as expressed in their People magazine, $12 billion cuts, and Harris said he wouldn't negatively impact classroom education. Yeah, remember you said the member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. He created an education crisis. He said that he would not close down hospitals. He closed down dozens of hospitals, fired thousands of nurses, and closed 10,000 hospital beds. This is the future under a PC government. We have to remember the past, particularly when explicitly they reference a $10, $12 billion in cuts Answer. in their People magazine. Sure. New question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, years of neglect under the Liberals and Conservatives have resulted in a school repair backlog of over $15 million, with serious consequences for the health and well-being of children. In the past two years, drinking water at more than 640 schools and childcare centres has failed lead tests. Under this Liberal government, school maintenance budgets are barely enough to keep schools from deteriorating further, and there is no funding to proactively fix the backlog. We know that Patrick Brown and the PCs do not have a plan to fix Ontario schools. Their platform is silent on school maintenance and repairs. Speaker, other than flushing and testing, what is this Liberal government's plan to ensure the safety of drinking water in Ontario schools? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Uh, the minister responsible for early years in child care. Minister responsible for early years and child care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for this very important question. I know how important it is to keep our child safe. As the minister responsible for early years and child care, safety is one of my top priorities. When we send our kids off to school or child care centres, we want to know that they are safe and healthy and being looked after. We will continue to work with our partners to ensure all children in child care and in schools in this province are safe and have access to clean drinking water. Our standards, Mr. Mr. Speaker, are the strongest in Canada, and we have strict rules in place requiring immediate action should an issue arise, so parents can rest assured that their children are safe. While lead is generally not found in the municipal drinking water, Ontario still requires every single daycare, school, and childcare centre in the province to test for it. We're the only Answer. province to do so. And I want parents and kids to know that over 98 per cent of those facilities meet or are better than Health Canada standards. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. Flushing and testing is not a solution. There is no safe amount of lead in drinking water, especially for children whose growing bodies absorb more lead than the average adult. As lead accumulates over time, it can affect children's brain and nervous system development. These recent lead tests showed concentrations at some schools that was more that was 100 to 300 times greater than the provincial standard. Western University engineering professor Claire Robinson says for the lead issue there's just really no quick fix and that all plumbing and fixtures containing lead should be replaced. Speaker, what is this Liberal government's plan to replace the plumbing and fixtures at the 640 schools and child care centers that tested above the provincial standard. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to again thank the member opposite because I think it's really important for parents out there to know that right now uh, Ontario's standards are the strongest in Canada. So we are absolutely looking at making sure that we are ensuring the safety of our children and that they are in safe and healthy environments when they head off to school or childcare. And parents can rest assured that their kids are safe. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we have a long-term plan. We have a long-term plan to address instances of lead in drinking water at schools and daycares. And this includes providing $1.4 billion this year for school repairs and upgrades. Absolutely important upgrades and very necessary infrastructure upgrades. And this is about this is really, Mr. Speaker, the largest investment ever, provincial investment in school renewal. So let's think about that. It's historic investment. Yes, uh, as part of the plan, we've also strengthened Ontario's water standards, which are already the strictest in Canada. And we want to make sure that children head off to school. New question, the member from BTC Short. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Now, Speaker, I know that great strides are being taken in Ontario concerning correctional services. And Howard Sapers, one of the leading voices in correctional services, was appointed Ontario's independent advisor on correctional reform and delivered. He has delivered two comprehensive reports that are helping inform Ontario's path forward. Speaker, our government has implemented substantial change through segregation reform, new hires to support our front lines, our facility health care systems, and more. Mr. Sapers and many community organizations, such as the John Howard Society, have recognized our commitment and are supporting our plan. So, Speaker, would the minister further detail our government's transformation of Ontario's correctional service system? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Beaches East York for this very important question. As of today, we have a total of 7,109 inmates in our custody and care at our 26 correctional facilities. 7,109 inmates that our government and our dedicated correctional staff are committed to rehabilitating in a safe and human manner. Mr. Speaker, are there issues within our system? Yes, but our government is not shying away from that. But this is exactly why we are implementing the greatest change to corrections in a generation. This is not about scoring political points and certainly not about rhetorics. This is about doing what's right, Mr. Speaker. Our government has taken action by hiring more staff, increasing mental health supports, Answer. investing in correctional infrastructure, and soon to come legislation to cement real and lasting change to the case to come. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for her very enlightened response. And, Speaker, I particularly look forward to seeing her tonight on Political Blind Date with the member for Parkdale High Park, TV Ontario, tonight at 9 o'clock. And I appreciate her dedication to reforming Ontario's correctional system, a dedication you see in that TV show, Speaker. And both the Minister and the Attorney General have been implementing progressive and modern changes to corrections, policing and the courts. And I know that their goal and the objectives of this government is to establish a truly 21st century justice system. And I know, Speaker, that my constituents in Beaches East York are expecting that our courts, our prisons, our policing and our support services are equitably fair and inclusive. So, Speaker, would the minister further detail our government's transformation of correctional services in Ontario? 
you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again for the member from Beaches East York for the supplementary. Our government is building two new facilities in Ottawa and Thunder Bay that will serve as models of innovation and renewal for years to come, where the needs of inmates and staff are put first. It is proven that warehousing of inmates simply doesn't work. But nobody seems to have told the leader of the opposition or and or the party opposite that. As a federal member of parliament and eager Harper Conservative, his greatest justice legacy was supporting mandatory minimums, which only resulted in further warehousing of inmates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we all know any failed conservative policy isn't complete, Mr. Speaker, without a substantial misguided budget cut. The leader of, of the opposition voted for a 10 percent cut in Correction Canada's budget, while his government Government was locking more people up. Mr. Speaker, we are basing our plan on the best Thank evidence. Thank you very much. New question, the member from Simcoe Green. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, Mr. David Harbeck, the manager of Somerville Seedlings in Everett, wrote to the Premier recently and said, quote, perhaps you're not aware that as we speak, the managers in charge of the Ontario tree seed plant closure are only giving us, the stakeholders, one option, not all options, as Minister McGarry has stated as recently as November 15th. Oh, I would suggest that the minister is grossly misinformed by her staff. The only option we are given is to get in line in hopes to get some of the seed that is left on the shelf." End of quote. Mr. Harbeck and the Ontario Tree Seed Coalition are asking the government to accept the transition proposal they submitted to the minister on October 13th. The proposal allows the ministry to walk away from the seed business, but maintains their leadership role through the fiscal support of the province's propagation and forestry genetic experts. Mr. Speaker, will the minister actually work with Question. stakeholders and accept the transition proposal? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for, for his question today. You know, I had a, an impromptu meeting recently with Ma Rob Keane, who is the, uh, the head of Forest Ontario, as you know, who had just actually had a meeting with my ministry the day before. And his comments were that we were working very well with them to identify all options. So we are meeting with not only the stakeholders and the nurseries, but we are identifying new opportunities for, for our private sector. The private sector now provides 80 per cent of the seed extraction and 100 per cent of the stock growing for the province. And I see this as an opportunity for private nurseries to expand operations as the ministry changes its focus to a science-based approach. So we continue to work with all of the uh, stakeholders to develop new policies, such as a new seed zone policy and create a new genetic archive. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Leeds, Greenville. Back to the minister. You know, Speaker, this minister claims she's still consulting, but those who have taken uh, part in those meetings report back that her staff is just going through the motions. Yeah. They're ignoring reasonable alternatives, alternatives from the industry to protect jobs and the environment by keeping the tree seed plant operating. Over two dozen environmental groups municipalities and private sector nurseries are opposed to the minister's plan. She mentioned uh, Forest Ontario. Uh, also, groups include Ducks Unlimited and the cities of Toronto and Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Ed Pacha, CEO of the Ferguson Forest Centre in my riding, wrote this to me, quote, this is really the last step in the Liberal government's abandonment of forestry in Southern Ontario, leaving no controls on future forest genetics. Question. Speaker, will the minister shelve this ill-conceived plan, or does she want her legacy to be the abandonment of forestry in Southern Thank Ontario? You. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and for the supplementary. But the new genetic archive will be a potential new source for the type of scientific information needed to address climate change. For example, our scientists will need to know exactly where the seeds have come from as they consider migrating tree species in reaction to changes in climate. So we continue to work with all of our stakeholders, with our ministry, to, uh, to continue all the important conversations to ensure that moving forward we have a modern seed uh, genetic archive and that we continue to grow the seeds. It's, in, it's important for me to note two 
Speaker, that the party opposite has not supported in the past. Under their government in the mid-90s, they privatized a system that put them in the, in the situation to begin with. We continue to work on this side of the That's House sir. to ensure that we have savings for the taxpayers and the important programs that we have moving forward. Thank Good you. Good question. Member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Acting Premier. People in London are worried today about an outbreak of a deadly virus in our city. In the past 18 months, invasive streptococcus has tragically taken the lives of nine, peop nine people and sent 30 to the intensive care unit. Local health officials have reached out to the U.S. Centers of Disease Control for help. They say the outbreak is, quote, very unusual. And that leaves people who are in hospital today or have to sit in the emergency department today worried and scared that this virus is not yet under control. What is this government doing to stop the deadly outbreak and keep people safe? Thank you. To the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're uh, very concerned about the uh, outbreak of Streptococcus A in London, Middlesex. It's a uh, uh, regrettably, it's an issue. It's taken many lives. It's uh, um, made many individuals uh, sick, uh, some extremely ill. Uh, and uh, regret unfortunately, it's a, a, an epidemic that has been going on for some time, more than a year, about 18 months. Uh, but I have to commend the public health unit uh, for London Middlesex are doing an exemplary job at doing everything they can to control and eventually eliminate uh, the risks associated with Strep A uh, in that region. Uh, and of course, we're working very closely, as is the Public Health Unit with Public Health Ontario, so that they are providing all necessary resources, uh, the best practices uh, and activities required to uh, get control over this epidemic. Uh, that it, yes, is, uh, it is regrettable uh, that uh, this uh, type of situation does uh, occur from time to time, to time in, in uh, the you. province, uh, but we're working closely on it. Thank you, Supplementary. Speaker, when an outbreak happens, our hospitals need to have the space and the resources to meet the demand. That's true when we're talking about a bad flu season or a deadly virus like streptococcus that can lead to toxic shock and even a flesh-eating disease. But under this government, London's hospitals have been pushed to operate far above their, beyond their capacity. Our hospitals are overcrowded every day. And even the be at the best of times, people are being forced to wait in hallways and the ER for care they need. What is this government? Why has this government pushed our hospitals into an overcrowding and underfunding crisis that only makes it harder to respond to urgent outbreaks like the one that's happening in London today? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I was. Uh... I was actually gratified to hear the first part of this question, but I'm absolutely <laughs> disgusted at the second part. That's right. That that's that right. member would somehow conflate a very serious public health situation involving her constituents that has taken lives. Mr. Speaker, that has taken lives and devastated families many of them the most vulnerable, marginalized people in her society, and that she would link that disgusting. to the situation in her hospitals, Mr. Speaker, is absolutely disgusting. It is, it is. the public health unit you that is— that, that, Well, you, you think— That's the uh, leader of the third party is warned. I would— uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs is warned. I'm not going to stop. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, there needs to be some things that are above partisan politics. I am a public health doctor myself. I know precisely what's going on in London. I'm watching it closely. We're providing all necessary supports. And to use that tragic situation to talk about Answer. hospital overcrowding is despicable, Mr. Speaker. We will end this epidemic and we will provide the maximum support to all. You seen it, please? You seen it, please? You seen it? Start the clock. 
That'll do. New question. Member from Northumberland Point US. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister, NAFTA re renegotiations have left my constituents feeling concerned and uneasy. Free trade and economic cooperation with the U.S. and Mexico is important. Hundreds of thousands of good jobs rely on it. I'm sure you can agree, Minister, our farmers and food processors work hard each and every day and play a crucial role in the success of our $37 billion farm and food sector. That is why it's important that their concerns and interests are not overlooked during the negotiation process. Can the minister please update this House on what our government is doing to support the interests of our, our, of our agri-food sector during the NAFTA negotiations? Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Northumberland Quinty West for a very important question this morning. Mr. Speaker, two-way agri-food trade between the United States and Ontario is worth nearly $28 billion, and the significance of this number cannot be ignored. NAFTA remains a foundation agreement between Canada, the United States, and Mexico that works well for all three countries. Over the past six months, I've been actively engaged with my U.S. counterparts and businesses to ensure that as NAFTA is modernized, quote unquote, we do no harm. On this side of the House, we'll continue to promote the interest of Ontario's agri-food sector during the negotiations. Not only have I been able to travel across several states to meet with many U.S. representatives, but I'll continue my ongoing engagement with my Agriculture Advisory Committee, comprising of leaders in our sector, to reinforce that our government stands with Ontario's agri-food sector. Most recently, Answer. I visited Mexico during the latest round of NAFTA negotiations, where I continue to stand up for the interests of each and every single individual across our agriculture community. I had the opportunity Thank to be you. Ontario Canada's chief negotiator to reiterate Ontario's position. Thank you, Minister, for that response. And it's great to hear that our government continues to yeah. promote Ontario agri-food interest, along with meeting with your U.S. counterparts to strengthen our trading relationship. Ministers, members of my constituency are concerned that our friends south of the border do not share our views with regards to our supply management system. The supply management system provides balance and protection for our farmers and pro producers and has yet and has played an integral role in the agri-food sector. Minister, can you please provide the House with an update on how you, you are reaffirming Ontario agriculture interest in the integrity of our supply management system? Thank you. Minister. I want to thank the member from Northumberland Quinty West for his supplementary. Our government has made it clear that any proposals that threaten the integrity of supply management are absolutely non-starters for the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, recent proposals made by the United States during NAFTA renegotiation could potentially lead to the dismantling of Canada's supply managed system, a system that represents 25 per cent of agricultural production in the province of Ontario. Let me be clear. Supply management works well for our province producers, our processors and consumers, as well as our economy. Mr. Speaker, I was a little concerned when I read uh, page uh, 56 of the uh, Glossy magazine. I would have thought there would have been some denunciation of one Maxine Bernier, who continues to traipse across Canada every day, talking about the dismantling of Ontario's supply management system. Uh, All of us can stand up against the kind of Inaccurate facts that he continues to bring. Thank you. New question, the member from Leeds, Grimble. Thanks, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Speaker, almost every court in Eastern Ontario has video remands, but the Attorney General is keeping the Brockville Courthouse stuck in the past. It takes two officers to escort prisoners from the jail to the court's detention centre. A third officer must then monitor prisoners. Brockville Police have done over 800 of these. It is a safety issue and also a terrible waste of valuable resources, all for uh, remand appearances that last about a minute. The jail is equipped to do video remands, but for five years, the Attorney General has ignored pleas from the Brockville Police to install video equipment in the court. Police Chief Scott Frazier, the Crown and Defence lawyers in Brockville all agree it's time to stop this dangerous, costly and unnecessary prisoner transfer. Speaker, will the Attorney General get with the times and finally press the play button on video remand system? Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. I think it's a very important question. Uh, you know, we continue to uh, evaluate all our uh, all our court uh, uh, houses across the province, make sure yeah. that they have they have the appropriate uh, uh, technology uh, available uh, to them. We've got video remand in many parts of the uh, the province. Um, I'm not obviously at this moment, Speaker, aware of any technical challenges or issues there may be in relation to Brockville uh, Courthouse, but I can tell the member opposite. There is a very active evaluation that, that goes on. We always want to make sure, Speaker, uh, that uh, our courthouses are safe, that the people who work in the courthouses are also always uh, safe, and that there is timely access uh, to justice when, uh, when issues uh, arise. So I, I again thank the member for asking uh, the question, and of course I will look into uh, where we are and what issues or challenges we may be facing uh, in providing for video remand at the Brockville Courthouse. Thank you. Good answer. The time for question period is over. I will recognize the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport on a point of order. Welcome officially the Film Ontario members joining us in the gallery. They've just dashed out, Speaker, but uh, more importantly, perhaps I'd like to ask all members to join us at 5 p.m. in Committee Room 230 later today for a fabulous reception. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.